Hey everyone, welcome to the Lake Michigan Angler Podcast. I'm Rob and this is Michael and today we're here with Josh Sopchuk, the president of Salmon Unlimited of Wisconsin. Welcome, Josh. Hey, thank you. We're glad to have you here. A lot to talk about uh, with the organization. Uh, this is kind of long overdue. There's quite a few areas to kind of, uh, I would hope that we can, we're going to be able to touch on today. Um, but I think the first thing we want to start with here is, you know, who you are, how did you get involved with Salmon Unlimited? Because as I've heard this story multiple <laughs> times, many other people have to know the story, but, uh, but, you know, it's kind of fell in your lap. Yeah. Uh, you know, my family, we've been lifelong shore fishermen, grew up in Waukegan and uh, came to Racine after college, fell in love with the area, continued the shore fishing up there. But about uh, four or five years ago, uh, our 10th wedding anniversary, I bought a small boat so we could watch the fireworks from the lake. And I had always had that dream, you know, how can I get out on the big water? And so we converted that boat, fished it for about a year and a half and realized, hey, we need to learn more from people who know. And, you know, where's the best place to go? It's these clubs, Salmon Unlimited Illinois, Salmon Unlimited Wisconsin. There's such great knowledge, a lot of experience. And so we joined, uh, became members, became active in the, the participation volunteer events and uh, about a year and a half ago, I said, well, you know, I've got a lot of experience on boards. I should volunteer to join the board. It's just a general member and uh, was easily nominated in uh, November of 22 with the expectation of starting in January. And uh, there was a uh, disagreement, we'll say, between uh, some of the board members and, and uh, it led to some openings in the board for the executive roles. And I had already had the intent or expectation, I, I work in finance as a background, that I could step in into a treasurer's position after I learned the operations of the board. I hadn't even been on it yet. And I was nominated instead for president <laughs> and then vice president <laughs> and then treasurer in the same meeting. And you can't be all of them. And I, I'm like, why that? Why do you want me as president? I haven't been here before. I don't know the operations of the club. <laughs> But I do know the operations of nonprofits. Uh, I've served on others for Root Pike Win for one for 10 years. Uh, we have a great steady operation and, and uh, I get along with everyone. I'm very, uh, uh, very approachable, I think, from all sides or all arguments. And so it made me a fit for comfort for what some of the board and some of the membership was looking for. And that's what we've strived to implement over the last uh, 12, 14 months. So I've uh, spent the first year getting my feet quite literally wet in understanding the operations of the club and trying to streamline or uh, fix some of the things that we're doing to make sure that we're uh, building the trust and camaraderie amongst all of our membership. And it, it's been a really strong run. And if you've seen the news lately, I and mean, we just keep growing and growing with excitement. Yeah, I mean, you said uh, you got your feet wet. I, I think it was more like they threw into the frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> it was really. Yeah, I, uh, again, the the meeting that was supposed to be my first meeting as a board member uh, ended up being the one where I was nominated as president. So I had literally not served on the board in At any all. capacity yeah. uh, before taking over the club. Yeah. Now, I, I've said this to you directly in our personal conversations. I'll say it here on the podcast. I mean, I think that... Uh, uh, this has turned out to be a huge win for the club by by you know you stepping into the role because I mean just in the short amount of time Rob and I have seen you know um, and obviously it's a team effort right but it, it all stems from leadership as well and and what you've been able to do your first year alone and now going into year two with some exciting things we're going to talk about it's really impressive man it's uh, thank you but there's one thing I said from the club day one which is. Uh, we are only as good as our volunteers and their skill sets. So the reason that I ended up in this role was disagreements over some of the operations where had we had a little bit more robust skill sets in, in volunteerism, uh, I frankly wouldn't be here. I'd be fishing uh, more often. <laughs> so, uh, I wouldn't be in this capacity within it. But we have uh, we've started to fill additional roles, get more people involved, uh, bring in, you know, if you if you don't have the skills to do the operations that need to be done, that's when you have to acknowledge, go pull in uh, mm -hmm. additional skill sets, yeah. whether it be volunteer-based or pay-based, to fill in those gaps so that things are you know well-rounded in operations. And yeah. we've we've done that. We've got some great members, uh, some from the Illinois Club who are uh, jointly in the Wisconsin Club too, who've stepped up into positions. Uh, I pulled in a uh, an active fisherman who's a client of mine to work as our treasurer, and we've just recently uh, signed on with a bookkeeper to help us with uh, even further 
delineating expenses and incomes uh, to show how effective some of our programs are. Uh, we do quite a bit on the on the uh, volunteer nonprofit side. Everyone thinks of us for Salmon Arama, but there is really a lot more that goes on yeah. in the club for public volunteerism, which is why we're a five hundred one c three. Right, and we w we definitely want to dive into that. Mm -hmm. um, in, in in before we do, kind of have you noticed the the sentiment amongst uh, club members kind of shift and starting to? I I won't speak on behalf of that because you know I again I I'm only have been part of the club for the last three, four years, and mm -hmm. it was truly in the membership meetings and those volunteer events. I'm, I'm naturally more of an optimist at heart, mm -hmm. uh, so I tend to see the brighter side of things with what's going on, and that's kind of why I was blindsided when, uh, when I got pushed into this. Mm -hmm. But we do see more people volunteering. Our Salmon Unlimited board uh, is more active in, in different roles, different capacities. Our Salmon, Unli or, uh, sorry, Salmon Unlimited board our Salmon Arama committee is probably three times the size it was in prior years, and that's helped with uh, spurring some of the success that we'll talk about later. Yeah. Uh, so we are seeing people get involved. We are getting new members signing up who've, uh, if, if you've filled out a, one of our renewal or new membership sheets, it, it lists out different programs that we'd ask if you have interest in going. And we're seeing more people offering to step up and be involved in those as well. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great thing. So let's talk about uh, Salmon Unlimited Wisconsin. Um, and let's, uh, I'd like for you to speak on it, uh, and speak to the, the angler who may not know exactly what it is and why they would want to be, you know, be a part of it. You know, what, what is it about, or what does the club do? What's their mission? Uh, kind of outline some of those things. Sure. So Salmon Unlimited Wisconsin was, uh, founded in 1974, uh, and the, I'm sorry, 1973, because it was a year before Salmon Arama, and we're hitting our 50th for that. But uh, the organization was founded uh, to promote the safe uh, safety and uh, uh, sport fishing within the Lake Michigan waterways and its associated areas. Uh, the membership is quite diverse. I mean, we have members in uh, states that don't even border the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of them travel here for the different events. Uh, we're known, obviously, in this region for a world-class fishery. Mm -hmm. And we, as an organization, uh, have elected to step into different fields that help promote that uh, fishery and promote the, uh, the development of it and the uh, community that would be involved with using it. And so that's everything from uh, river cleanups and volunteerism, youth events, Salmonorama club events uh, to build camaraderie, uh, but quite a diverse base of different programs. The buoy, uh, I think a lot of our members uh, around this area, a lot of our population, whether they're members or not, utilize the buoy for safety data. Uh, but that's all part of the programs that we fund off of our nonprofit. Just uh, just to expand on that buoy, so people are clear, you're, the SU Wisconsin Club managed to pull the resources, and a lot of money, obviously, coordinated it <laughs> with. Uh, uh, obviously, you had to work with federal and state partners uh, and uh, even a college, I believe. Is there, is there a college involved in yeah, this? Yeah, uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, Milwaukee's School of Freshwater Sciences team helps us with the deployment, uh, management, and retrieval, as well as over uh, out season uh, repair and maintenance. Uh, like you said, that, that program was really spearheaded by uh, my predecessor in the role, from what I understand, Ron Wesley helped with uh, getting that buoy in place. And then quite a bit of fundraising efforts, I believe, uh, by Jim LaFortune. Uh, and you know, Jim's, if, if you know Salmon Arama, you'll, you'll know Jim's story, but uh, he's really been committed to the club and to uh, fundraising for some of our different activities. Yeah. And so this buoy, if you don't know, you can actually access the information on it. It gives you the uh, temps, the wave heights, yeah, a lot um, of point information. Water temps, uh, not only at surface, but approximately every 12 feet down, uh, there's a reading all the way to the bottom. So, you know, we, we all love our fish hawks. We all love our, um, uh, I don't use a fish hawk myself. <laughs> I uh, actually have a depth rater, but uh, we, all, we all love our probes. Uh, but for those who don't have one, can't afford it, they're, you know, they're getting quite up there in price, you can at least get a, a, a regional view of where the thermocline might be uh, by looking at that probe. It also uh, gives you the current readings at every one of those temperature spots too, and then uh, gives you wind direction and uh, wind speed as well. Right. So it's, a, it's another great reading point, and unlike many of the other buoys in our area that are one to two miles offshore, 
we had the ability to help select our site and knowing that it was driven for fishermen and safety for them, we pushed it out. So it's about six miles out right off the hill. That, that's a great. So you guys can access that. And that's that's one of many things that the, the club um, has done. And I guess why, you know, membership is important involved, and being involved is important, right? It is. The, it's through the efforts of our membership, uh, not only their membership fees, but their donation of time and effort uh, that help with the other fundraising that help cover the cost of these. The buoy each year, I, and again, new, newer to this role, uh, from what I've seen, that the cost to us is roughly eight to $10,000 a year between drop-in and retrieval costs and then overseason uh, maintenance, maintenance costs. Uh, the cost for the data, uh, we do have a, a cell phone-based uh, transmitter out there that's reporting the data. Had a little fun with that this year. We're hoping to have that fixed, but uh, <laughs> sometimes it was inconsistent. But yeah, there, there's a lot of cost that goes into that and the other programs, and it's the membership that drives that activity. Uh, you know, the Salmonorama this year, uh, the volunteerism in uh, gaining sponsorships and gaining partners has been stronger uh, than any year that I've seen it before. And, you know, we've got some excitement to talk about on that end yeah. because of it. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be great. Um, I guess we, we should probably pivot into that, right? Because um, Salmon Arama has been one of the longest running, uh, uh, biggest in terms of, you know, how many people can participate in this across the lake, right? It's just, yeah, I mean, yeah. lake-wide, shore fishermen, boat fishermen, kayak fishermen. Every, you know, every category. Every, everybody's covered. Yeah, you've got every category you can think of in there. For for kids up to adults, teams. Uh, you have like you, then within it, you have uh, two different tournaments within it within the yeah, tournament. Yeah, the mini tournaments. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's so many different ways to um, get involved, participate, potentially win money. It's yep. it's the Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory of fishing. Yeah, and you walk into your dreamland. You've got mini tournaments on two of the first three days. Uh, you've got a long play event with the Big Five. That's located within the tournament itself it's a you know from, to my heart i love some of the stories we've had the last couple of years of the winners i mean like you said two years ago nick van gompel in a kayak yeah is beating out charter boats beating out boats like mine that can hold five six people uh it, it you know anyone can win it yeah. anyone can win it it's just you know it, we've seen kids win it yeah you know yeah it's uh yeah it's 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 takes you know some skill but there's luck involved too so yeah sure you don't have to yeah. be in, intimidated by some of the other boats that are fishing yeah right no no and and then this past year man was uh you know let me see this last year in 2023 mm -hmm. boy was it one of the best week-long periods of weather it was a great <laughs> yeah. tournament yeah i mean everyone was out and that last day on that saturday yeah when we went out we we, we left our North Point, saw. the conga line. I've never oh. seen it in our area look that yeah. full of boats. Sounds like Surgeon Bay. That's, uh, you know, you yeah, hear that's the story. I've never been up there, but I've heard yeah, about it. Yeah, their legendary line. Um, you know, two years ago, we had some tough weather uh, on a couple oh, yeah. days, some chops, some storms. Last year was magical. Uh, I remember a podcast you guys actually did a little uh, later, uh, toward the end of last year, where you're re uh, reciting it. And you acknowledge that there was a lull after Salmonorama because the weather was so good. Everyone had burnt themselves out from being out It was out the there hardest the whole I've seen people fish during Salmonorama. Yeah. yeah. You know, like they're they're in in the morning, they're going back out in the afternoon, they're doing evening trips. Oh, it was coming a back. Double, double day. Like, yeah. By the end of the week, the people coming in the store were a little delirious. They were a little <laughs> sleep deprived. They were zombies. They were like, like zombies they were, in the store. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had never really seen that before. Like they fished hard. In 2020, even I yeah. took off for like the. the I didn't <laughs> see. Jay, I barely did any fishing the at, at the back end of July, and maybe like the beginning of August. But then August, we paid for that nice weather because August was brutal. Yes, if you were yes. in a small boat, oh, yeah, boy. you weren't really getting out much. That August was brutal. Yeah, but it shaped up. You couldn't have asked for a better setup for weather wise for salmon Rama. and it was. You know, I I don't know if you guys share turnout numbers and all this stuff, but I have to imagine there had been a great amount of people involved in this yeah and the uh total participants and remember that you know the beauty of salmon arama is you don't even have to own a boat to be in it you can be a shoreman yeah you can rent a charter and the charters uh, many of them themselves are registered as a charter boat which means every one of their passengers throughout the event is also eligible for their catch so 
you know, if you're if you're looking to book a charter uh, during the week of Salmonorama, check off our website and make sure that they're one that participates because then you're automatically entered into it. But we had over 3,400 unique uh, entrants recorded last year for the event. It was, I think it was the largest count we have had. And again, that, that includes all the charter boats, all the shoremen, all the, uh, the group tickets, but it was quite robust and we had the perfect weather and that really yeah. led to a successful event for us for the fishing tournament. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's all, the, the, the main hub is out of Racine and, and obviously if you've never experience it's definitely worth coming down the race scene to to watch the the weigh-ins i mean it's so cool we've we've gone on there and broadcasted some of the weigh-ins and stuff mm -hmm. and you know to see the quality of fish that these anglers are out there catching and bringing in and you know the cooler opens up and here's this giant laker <laughs> or this big old king or a big perch you're like you know yeah. it really it really paints a picture like man you know things are looking good on the lake you know, oh, things are really looking good in the lake with our fish. And uh, and on top of that, you know, just that uh, we have so many people that are doing well for themselves in terms of angling. You know, guys are really dialing things in there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's again, it's the development of the next generation. Uh, and that's something that I attribute for myself and our family with the club uh, in learning. But uh, there's different avenues of getting people in, whether they come in and see Rob and the team here in the shop, or they go join one of these clubs, or they just get out on their own. But keeping that going, uh, you know, we don't want the, the sport to become something that you can't afford to get into, or that you don't have, uh, you don't have the confidence to try because you don't have a, a mentor within it. And I think, uh, you know, our side of the lake has got a, a really strong presence in helping develop that next generation. I think it's, really important because we get to experience just the event itself right we get right. to sign up get a ticket <laughs> come experience the back end come yep. volunteer <laughs> oh this, all, this, this is the segue into it right oh. you know we get to experience just the the fun part go oh. out there grind it all out oh. you know fish morning and then and then go back out for the evening if you didn't get your limit and and, and you're just out there pounding away um some guys even would stay the night in the harbor and go yeah. right back out in the morning you know, oh, a yeah. lot of grinding a lot yep. of grinding but for this one week period, it's really a year long nonstop yes. operation to run it. Oh my gosh. Where do we even start in terms of what it takes on the back end? What are some of the things that are happening back there that allows you even to pull this thing all off? It, because I think it's important for people to understand the amount of work. And, and you, you know, uh, Jim of Fortune's been there. Yes. Yeah. You know, spearheading it for a lot of years. Uh, Craig is also. Craig Bender, yes. You know, done done uh, great things. and, and uh, I don't understand how these guys don't have drinking problems. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know Craig very well. He's uh, he's moved north, but he comes down and helps the event uh, these last couple of years. I, uh, I, I, I should say I know him. He's across the dock from me uh, uh, chartering with uh, Jim Miller uh, quite a bit. But I don't, uh, I haven't had the, the opportunity to invest as much time with him as I have with Jim. Uh, again, walking into this role, and I blame Jim. Jim was the one who ended up getting me stuck into this role with his nomination. <laughs> <Suck>. <laughs> uh, but um, it was a learning experience uh, on two fronts. Uh, and all, uh, again, like I said, it was a crash course for me getting into the club and its operations. But knowing that this event is the most critical part of the success of our organization for all of our other public outreach, I, you take the memberships, they're $35 a piece. Uh, that doesn't get you very far for community yeah. outreach. That doesn't even cover the cost of the buoy. It's the success of primarily this event that really drives that because this is where sponsorships are are more popular. Yeah. You know, we get a lot of face time for people and their businesses to get involved in donating to the club. But Jim has a gargantuan task every year. And um, I invested myself in the last 12 months of it in order to understand what has to happen. Because again, as a nonprofit person, I look at redundancy. You know, you have, it's nonprofits, it's volunteers, there's turnover, people change in roles. What happens if Jim gets hit by a bus Yeah. or gets sick, which is why he's not here today. <laughs> Pretty nasty flu. But if something happens to Jim, a lot of it was driven by his operation in the past couple of years. Who runs this event? How yeah. does this happen? What needs to be done? Yeah. Who do you talk to? There are, I think, 13 weigh-in ports active this year. There are 
somewhere around 50 sponsorships that we've already gained this year. Uh, and many of them I've, I've been uh, connected with because of my uh, engagement within the community and who I am as a, as a you know, banker, as a lender. But Jim has a lot of those relationships in place from other years. There are the rules, there are the site selection and access, there are activities other than just the fishing event. Uh, many people don't realize, and some of our community up in Racine has not even realized, but Salmonorama used to be a massive, massive community event. And uh, that, that piece had slid away a little bit, and we're bringing that back, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But all of that was driven by Jim as the committee chair, and making sure that we had more volunteers and involvement uh, from our board and from our uh, club members into making this happen helps deleverage him, which takes the stress off him so he doesn't have a heart attack, but also creates redundancy to make sure that if something happens that we still are fluid in making this massive, you know, highly complex event happen. And I, I tip my cap to the, uh, uh, the gentlemen who are uh, looking to run the other tournament out of Michigan. Uh, because he's, you know, he's got his hands full, I'm sure, with the same type of logistics to make this a, a success. Yeah, that would caught me off guard, not to derail, but uh, when I saw that, Rob, you mentioned it to me about this uh, lake wide and giving away boats. Every, I was like, wait, that, that's, <laughs> I was like, oh boy, that's a, that's a big mm -hmm. one. I can only imagine, yeah. The, the, yeah. I mean, we're doing our stuff, and even then, you know, I can imagine on a bigger scale how much. Uh, yeah, I don't know if his is a for-profit based operation or non-profit. Uh, you know, there may be motives for the boat supplier that that's great i think it's again things that further the fishery and mm -hmm. get people involved are good for it it's it's going to be good for the community to to give it a shot but um uh, i i just tip my cap to him in respect and seeing what jim dealt with uh in my first year of being experienced with him uh these guys that run these events put their heart and soul into it and it's not easy sometimes it can be stressful sometimes it can cause some uh uh, hurt feelings or, or frustration, uh, frustrating things to be said between people. Yeah. Uh, but it is a lot that goes into making a success. Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause then, you know, you have, uh, differing opinions or beliefs on the, how to handle things. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, challenges with it, but I think if there's one common denominator, um, and you know, this is speaking because we, we've jumped into it on our side yep. too, which is you, you do it out of the passion for, for you know what it is we do, you know we're trying to keep that fishery alive, trying to give anglers something to be excited about, yes. you know, and and especially uh, to get new blood into it. Yes, yeah, and that, you know? that constant circulation. You you don't strain people out if you bring new uh, participants, new volunteers, new uh, partnership organizations in. It, it keeps it fresh. It keeps it vibrant. Yeah, yeah. And so, with that being said. Obviously, Salmonorama is is a very big deal for the club in itself. So it allows you to accomplish some of your other goals. Yes, yeah, and, and all of that. Um, so Salmonorama happens. Okay, let's look back at twenty twenty three. Salmonorama happens. It is done. It's over for the week, right? Yeah, yeah. Then we wait till next July and just restart. It's magical. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> sure it isn't. So once it's done, yeah. When does everything kick in gear? For the next year, like walk me through that year long period. Give me a timetable, generally speaking, of this time we're doing this. You know, how, how does that work? It doesn't stop. Uh, so, right after Salmonorama, uh, our treasurer is working with Jim and working with the communication with the other uh, volunteers to make sure that we have all the distributions for the uh, payouts. The, the payouts. That was, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're getting more efficient with that. Uh, one thing that we do that other tournaments don't have probably the opportunities. We're blessed to have a, um, uh, a software engineer who's designed a program that runs our entire tournament. And so it makes the data collection and the weigh-ins a lot more efficient. But uh, some of the other things like the 1099s, we're finding more efficient ways now that we've got a bookkeeper in place to preload that stuff so that we're not chasing people down right. after the event to get their, their weigh-in information right. uh, or their uh, tax information. Uh, along with that, we're already starting to look at reconfirming sites, uh, finding out if there are any problems or hot button issues to address over the, the off season, uh, starting with our donations and sponsorships. You know, a big one for us every year, uh, Yamaha is our champion sponsor. Yep. Uh, they've been with us for, I think it's uh, going on nine or 10 years now, and uh, making sure that that relationship is well cared for, uh, making sure that our partner, our larger partner sponsors who had more than simply their name on the back of the t-shirt and advertising at the site 
uh, felt that they, you know, were valued for the sponsorships that they were given a lot of relationship building. Yeah. Uh, we then start transitioning in October, November, and we're starting to build for the following year. So it's gaining or um, re-certifying uh, those sponsors for the same roles or different roles again. Uh, again, when we talk about the festival that goes along with it, it has grown from uh, a final day event to include a family day and some other activities. And so we're starting to bring in uh, different nonprofits or partners to work with us to make that more uh, robust. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're, we're trying to make more of the community engagement. The fishing tournament has always been strong. Right. Uh, that part of it, uh, people, you know, in the community, they, some think that they've seen that salmon -rama has gone away and they don't realize the tournament has been there, but the, uh, the uh, venue and the entertainment had changed partially because of uh, restrictions on site. And I spent a great deal of time over this fall uh, re-engaging that and putting us back into a, uh, a spot that uh, really raised a ruckus in our, our community, or a lot of excitement, not a ruckus, but a lot of excitement about what we're about to do this year yeah. uh, for our 50th anniversary. And it, it really has started from right at the end of the prior year's tournament. So it's just, it's year long. There's it, no stopping that beast. Ag again, it, yeah. It, and that's where, you know, I have to tip my cap to, you know, Jim being the committee chair uh, I have spent shoulder to so shoulder with him for the past 12 months in being involved in understanding the different things that happen in this. Mm -hmm. And there, it's just a mammoth effort. Yeah, it, it really is incredible <clears throat> undertaking. And, uh, you know, the thing too is like, you know, Jim's there doing all the stuff behind the scenes and then he's there for that week weighing in those fish yeah. and running around <laughs> like... He's a, he's a, he's a maniac, but, uh, he's, he's not perfect, but he's pretty good. You know, he's, uh, <laughs> he, he's, he's a classic up North fisherman. He speaks his mind. Uh, yeah, don't and, hold back. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes we had, uh, we had a, a reporter come down and had a little uh, issue because they weren't giving him a lot of time as he was trying to raise awareness on other things. And then, you know, they wanted to know about the way and then the fishing is like, can you at least talk about the fact that we brought veterans down? And, you know, he's trying to, to show the community what we're doing. And but sometimes his delivery can be a little less PR than it needs to be. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Yeah, no, no. But he's, he's a great guy and he's committed yeah. to this role. Yeah, no, it, re it really is amazing. Um, you mentioned about some of the things going on. We got the 50th yes. year anniversary coming yes. up. So as we kind of shift into talking about what's going to be different for the big 50th celebration and um, what, what it seems like a, a little bit of a direction change in terms of adding back what used to be some of the yes. glory days in terms of um, it wasn't just a tournament, but it was a cause. It was a, it was a reason for the community at large to come gather around uh, you know, this week long fishing yeah. event here. Um, now, obviously, that's going to take a lot of work, of course, but specifically dealing with uh, the city of Racine mm -hmm. and, and all the, the local governments to do all these kinds of things. So, you want to talk about what's going on in the kind of like this addition or the expansion for yeah. Summer Ramon this year? If the people who've been around for 20, 40 years or 50, if you've been there from the start, this is our 50th. Uh, Salmonorama was more the fishing tournament. I feel like at times back when it began was the side note to the festival that went with it. But Salmonorama started was started by a club called the Tuesday Optimists Club of Racine, and it was a nonprofit uh, that uh, you know just did betterment for youth in the community. They had five nonprofits partnered for them and four others that ran a full festival. And if you've seen some of the overhead views uh, on Facebook, some of our historical uh, Facebook, if you remember Racine Wen sites, they've done a great job of putting some uh, old pictures from plane flyovers. It was Summerfest almost on the Racine lakefront. There were multiple tents, there were live bands every night, there was entertainment, there was a fish pond, there was uh, you know just all these different entertainment items going along with the fact that the fishing tournament was going on, which, Back at the time, as we know, the fishing was a little different. Those piers were packed with shoremen because we had a different uh, water. Fishery. Yeah, yeah, we had a different fishery, different water set than we do now. But that event uh, over the years, and I don't know when, has sort of faded away. Part of it was changes of sites. Uh, we, you know, we've had uh, gone from the lakefront boat launch, uh, City Racine boat launch, which was undeveloped at that time, uh, to different spots like Pershing Park. And most recently, we've had a long and great run with um, uh, Racine's Reef Point Marina 
which is a, a county parcel. Uh, when they built out the, uh, the harbor area beyond just the breakwater walls, the dilemma with that site, although it's absolutely beautiful and the team there has been very helpful with us between uh, Racine, uh, uh, brew, uh, the brew house restaurant and the uh, uh, harbor itself, mm -hmm. the parking situation was absolutely horrendous. We had, the, the parking is effectively shared between the brew house restaurant, the marina, including the patrons where my boat is you know, behind the gate, and then here we bring this tournament and event down. Right. And by the way, our tent takes up about 30 of the spots of that parking lot. So we're, we had two small parking lots out on the peninsula. And beyond that, you would either try to squeeze in somewhere or you would go to the parking garage. And it really limited the number of people that would come down. It would create some frustration between the three partners who use that space. It was not where we belonged, but it was, it was where we had and it was a good source. I did a lot of work into trying to get involved with the um, festival hall site, which was managed by another third party. And Jim had tried a, a few years earlier too. The rate that we were given back then was not really compatible with a nonprofit. And they also would be taking the revenues uh, from uh, beer and alcohol sales or soda sales. And you know, if you're running an event and you're paying for the site and trying to fundraise and you take that away, there's not much yeah, left. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Yeah, so it, we, we had an, uh, a third party uh, along the river who was uh, very generous in trying to set up a site and we were near setting up with him when the city and a, a new party announced that they were changing the management at Festival Hall Grounds. And the new party reached out to us, Patrick Flynn, uh, was looking like he was going to get this contract. And he he's also a former Salmonorama fisherman himself. Him and his family are very that helps. active. That helps. It helps. But he he's really about the community. He runs a, a, a 5K nonprofit, uh, that, a site that runs uh, 5Ks all around the region and likes to get involved in community events. And so he's taking over the management with a new firm and wants us back. And so we were able to create a partnership Loosely structured off some uh, a program that I worked with one of the staff at the uh, the prior administrator of the park site, uh, but it also gives us a way to earn revenue down at the site off of the beverage sales. So that partnership changed everything. We could finally get to a site that could host us. It gives us both, I'd say, uh, uh, fifty to one hundred percent space for us to actually lay out all the festival. You know, it's it's more than just the big tent. We have boats down there, trucks down there. We had kid games. We have live music. Our space is more than doubled. But additional to that, it allows us to do some of the other uh, event celebration items that we've wanted to do, but we simply had no capacity. Yeah, you had the do. space to do it. Now. And what a year to do it with it being the 50th. So we're looking at bands? We're looking at bands every night of the week. So in prior years, uh, we had had, last year, we had two bands on two nights, one band each day, and uh, one was a family day, uh, had some, uh, some youth events and some family stuff going on there, but it, it was very, again, very limited. It was kind of a test run for us. This year, we were able to secure a grant that is putting bands in our event every night of the week, and on certain days, we're going to have two bands. We're going to have one kind of an early afternoon, mm -hmm. and then like an the evening classic band. evening, six to nine, seven to 10, depending on the day. Uh, are, we, are, we, are we getting uh, fireworks? We are getting fireworks. We just found out yesterday uh, that we were awarded uh, part of what we were asking for, uh, but our organization is committed to making that happen. So we're going to have on the opening night a fireworks show as well, uh, along with a, uh, a, one of our bands playing mm -hmm. uh, on that Friday the 12th. So the night before the tournament starts, which it's midnight on Saturday, we kick in. Uh, we're going to have a kickoff event uh, probably starting at about 6 or 7 o'clock. I think the band's due on at 7 o'clock, and the fireworks will fire off you know, somewhere around 9, 9.30. And, and what else? Are you going to have like food vendors there? How, how, what, yes. else, what else do we got? Yeah, and that's, that's where, again, we talk about what uh, you know, Jim and the, the Salmonorama Committee, uh, which there's, there's about 15 people uh, of which I'm part of that is invested in operating the event. We can't do it all. Uh, we can't manage the tournament, manage bands, manage food, manage, uh, we're gonna have, I'll share some of the art stuff going on down there, but you'll see it coming out too. So we're, we're bringing in partners to help with these that will benefit them in different ways. Uh, for example, the food, we're actually having food trucks and local restaurants uh, who are willing to come down. We're not charging them for that. 
we we just want them to be there because then yeah. we don't have to manage the food. Right. They have the licenses. They have certainly have the recipes. Right. And so that's a win win yeah, for sure. Two or three food vendors every day uh, will be down at the site. You know, from uh, late morning, probably setting up around eleven o'clock to catch the lunch, all the way till close at mm-hmm. nine or ten o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, we're also going to have uh, vendor fairs, and this will be fishing and non-fishing related. So we're setting up a spot of roughly 20 or 25 vendor booths for just general businesses that want to set up and, and uh, sell. Again, no charge uh, from our club. We'd, we'd love it if they donate something for our raffles that we do. Yeah. But if not, you know, we just want to get them down there because it creates <clears throat> that event. We're having... Uh, different uh, local daily events too. So one okay. of our food vendors is uh, uh, likely to be running a, uh, a bago tournament. Uh, and you know they run three different, uh, three different leagues and two tournaments already from their own operation, but they're gonna bring uh, and do a separate one down there. And again, it'll be a buy-in, uh, there'll be cash prizes for that, they'll handle that whole thing. It's just creating more for the community. Uh, we'll also have a vendor space for our partners in the fishing industry. Mm-hmm. So if any of them want to come down, uh, those who are working with us in partnership and sponsoring, you know, they last year we had uh, Dakota lithium marine batteries. We had Yamaha. Uh, they had their trailer down. We don't know that it's going to make it this year because some changes in their uh, staffing. But uh, we had them down uh, with their new um, trim tabs. Uh, they just acquired a company that uh, produces trim tabs, and they were demoing those out there. Uh, so we're, we're looking to have that involvement both in the fishing and non-fishing. One of the things that I'll share that we don't know for sure that we're going to get, but we're, we're working hard toward it. Uh, well, there are two things. Two things during the 4th of July parade, we were handing out leaflets. I had never heard so much about cheese curds in my life. <laughs> if been, it's Wisconsin. I mean, oh, my yeah. God. If you'd been to Salmonorama, the event, back in the day, the Kiwanis Club of Racine, which was another one of those volunteer groups, had made some sort of legendary cheese curd, fried cheese curds that were different than anything anyone else had made. And so we had uh, Dave Brinkman, member of ours, uh, he and his wife went out and hunted down the old Kwani members that we could and asked them, and we were able to get uh, slight variations of what they said the recipe were. They, but they all, you know, when we talked to five different ones, they all kind of had some similarities, and we think we have their recipe. You know, for the people in Racine who remember them, we, we're bringing the cheese curds back. We're, we're trying. <laughs> uh, the other one that we heard about a lot was the kids' fishing pond or the youth fishing pond. So uh, in the day, they used to have a small stocked uh, brook trout, I believe it was, uh, in, in a, a little pond. And the kids can come by and pay a couple bucks and try to fish for one and get a prize. Yeah. So I'm currently working on a sponsorship request to fund that. And there's two parts to it. There's... The, the operation of it every year is probably about $1,500 to $2,000 a year. Uh, that's buying the fish, the bait, any of the other supplies to maintain it. The other half of it is we don't have one. We haven't had one in 20 plus years. Right. So, you know, we're looking at, okay, do we, you know, what type of pool basin do we use or a, a structure of that? Uh, had a great conversation with a uh, fish supplier and they warned us to get a pool, a chiller, water chiller, because we have to get that temperature down. It's mid July and we're Yeah, seeing, oh, yeah. You know, all these. Uh, you probably want to cover them too the, so that oh, they're not cooking in the sun. Yes, in yeah. Two we, foot of water. We were, <laughs> so we've got that part figured out. Okay. Uh, if you've seen Festival Hall Grounds, it's got a massive overhead structure and we can put this underneath and in the shade. Okay. But even that is not enough. The ambient temperature in July is mid 70s to low 80s. Uh-huh. Um, this chiller unit is supposed to bring the water temp down 12 to 15 degrees, should be perfect. But these are things that we never thought of before. Yeah. And it's something that. Like I said, the, the number of people that brought it up, uh, when we, we had a group of volunteers, we always have the big fish uh, go down the parade route for the 4th of July. I had never heard so much about uh, kids fishing pond and cheese curds. And so we're trying to bring both of those back because apparently they, there's some reverence in Racine uh, in, and the community that comes down to the festival. But yeah, it's going to be a show this year. I and mean, we got bands, we got things to do, people to see. There's going to be a lot of different food. We're not going to have, we're, we're having a, two or three different style, different foods. So if you're a burger guy, if you're, uh, you know, uh, Mexican or Latin or, you know, something completely off the wall, they're going to be different food types to have down there every day, uh, for lunch and for dinner. So it's, it's a space to experience beyond just the fishermen. And we will have the coolers with the big fish. Yeah. And people get to watch as they're the way in. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got to, I mean, 
I, I got to imagine here, obviously, just in general, Seminarama generates a lot of money, um, n not even for the club, but we're talking about for um, the local area, right? Yeah. You know, and the area, and that, you know, local meaning wherever these other ports are weighing in fish. Because yeah. that brings, you know, we're, we're a weighing station, yeah. so mm -hmm. we benefit yeah. as well and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so... But more specifically, as it pertains to what's going to be going on for the 50th and the, this kind of uh, expansion and change and mm -hmm. like the addition and trying to grow it back up into more than just the fish way and stuff, but more of like an event for everyone to come enjoy. Yes. Um, you know, how, how does the, the city racing feel? I know that from my understanding, they've, they're making a lot of investments in that lakefront. You know, it seems to be the case in a well, lot of cities along the lakefront. Yeah. You know, that, development and, and really trying to get it going. And, yeah. And it seems like, you know, what Salmon Arama and Salmon Unlimited Wisconsin brings to the table, middle of the summer, mm -hmm. is, is something that they would want to have and, you know, support, right? Oh, of course. I, and again, growing up in Waukegan, you know, I love my hometown, but let's walk through that lakefront for accessibility and beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the Johns Manville site on the far north end, then the power plant. And the water treatment plant. Then you got the beach, and then you know you've got some industrial in the harbor still. Uh, you've got the marinas and the south side to North Chicago's environmental Superfund sites. Racine. One of the things that I fell in love with was that downtown area and that waterfront area. That lakefront is so much more accessible up there. Yeah. Uh, and they and they took the initiative, you know, along with uh, I'll, I'll give props to the the. Johnson family, you know, of SC Johnson, uh, Johnson Outdoors, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the bank even, even though they're my competitor. But uh, <laughs> they, you know, that family and other uh, businesses and the community itself, uh, with work with the DNR, did a lot of investment back in the 80s to clean up their sites that were similar. We're all part of that industrial manufacturing lakefront. And you look at what Racine has done and what Kenosha is doing, and, or, or pretty much done now, uh, you know, the accessibility and the beauty of the waterfronts up here, they're places you want to be. Uh, downtown Racine is really vibrant during the summer. They have First Fridays events. They have the Party on the Pavement events that are hosted by Downtown Racine Corporation, which is a, a nonprofit that promotes that area. And they're, uh, they're in lockstep with helping with us. In fact, they were the ones that helped me source one of the fireworks vendors uh, to be affordable enough to do this. Because, again, you look at our nonprofit, our operating budget outside of the San Rama event is about $45,000. That, that's really all we are. But we've got this gorilla of a yeah. 225000 maybe $250,000 tournament that goes on for nine days. And so, they, yeah, they love what it does to bring into the community. Like you said, there is a, a disproportionate amount of event in Racine because that's where it's all from. Yeah. Uh, but we do have ports all the way up to Washington Island uh, weighing in. You know, we've got you guys here in Illinois. We've got, I think, three in Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, potentially looking to, you know, to expand that. It is a lake-wide event, and it's, again, to promote the fishery and, and promote sport fishing. Yeah. Now, I want to kind of change gears here um, and ask you this question because um, – so it's so something I've been curious about, but when you run this style of tournament, right? You know, it's it's very different when you run a one day tournament where you go to the marina, you weigh in right, right there, and all that stuff. How how do you handle uh, uh, a tournament this big where anybody can weigh in fish in these different locations, um, and you know, making sure everything is above board with all of that and, and the challenges that may come with that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, we don't have. Uh uh, metal detectors at every one of our ports, <laughs> but we, uh, we bang, bang to the wall, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, they're, I'm sure they're not the only ones. No, 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 I, yeah, that's sure, just sure. the one that hit the news, obviously. Yeah. But no, uh, there, you know, we, uh, we're blessed by it being the entire lake. Uh, so for qualifying waterways, you know, we, we run into, uh, experiences where certain tournaments, there's questions about where the guys on this side of a state line or that side of a state line within the same waterway. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't have to thankfully deal with that. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about the, uh, the questionability of the fish being stuffed because the winners are usually brought down here and they're, uh, they make an incision, uh, check for certain aspects. Uh, I did buy after that event 
I did go out and buy a metal detector so we could scan every one of our fish as well that uh, come down to our port before uh, for the final tournament. And, and real quick, just to touch yeah. that, um, so if, if someone catches a fish that is a contender for first yeah. standing, they have to bring it down so that it is for sure verified yeah, we, to we, be seen, right? we look to bring those down. I mean, let, let's be honest, and, and we're working with uh, uh, the gentleman who's running the ultimate uh, derby as well uh, from the Michigan side because he's got a similar rule set, so we're trying to play well with each other in the sandbox. Uh, but we both have the same mindset. you got to verify those fish. And so historically, we've had them, they're brought down, and we display them in a cooler frozen, uh, and then... You know, that way we have the opportunity to check them uh, before the end of the tournament. They are still verified on weight at the local scales that they're at as well. So unless there's a substantial variance between the two. And th this is where, I, you know, Jim is sick today, but I really wish he or Michelle uh, were able to speak on this because they, they've done a great job in underwriting that aspect. But, uh, you know, from the general standpoint, I'll say that we have... Uh, a pretty robust system for verification on the weight of the fish and, and to make sure no shenanigans are done. But, yeah. you know, there's a reason the scammers are out there in the world. If they find a way to do it, they will. Sure. And, you know, our tournament last year was, what, $32,000 in cash and prizes? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a big first prize. And yeah. even second and third are not cheap either. So, yeah, we, we do rely on the character of our uh, contestants as well as uh, the recognition of our weigh-in teams at the different ports to help us yeah, with sure. vetting that out. Right, yeah, super important, all of that. And it just goes to to, to the entire complexity of all of it. Yeah. That there's so many different angles you have to look out for and consider. And, and, and there's one thing I will speak out on this because we had an incident last year. Uh, people have to remember our board, our club, is completely volunteer. It's unpaid. Our salmon rama team is unpaid. They're volunteers. Our weigh-in ports, their staff, they're all volunteers. And we will not tolerate harassment. Uh, there's, there's a difference between objecting to a result and being an outright you-know-what. Mm -hmm. And we won't tolerate that. Uh, we had an incident last year that we had to remediate, and we'll continue to do the same if somebody feels threatened at one of our weigh-in ports over uh, whether it be a weigh-in or an identification, we do have a way to escalate identifications. Uh, and, you know, Jim, as the chairman, has the final authority on, uh, you know, on any identification questions. But there's no reason to be a jerk to any of these volunteers. Sure. Yeah. This event only happens because of them. And if you create that environment that you're abusive or abrasive to them, we may lose them as a way import and it, it just loses out for the entire community. So just please keep that in mind that everyone in this event is a volunteer. Uh, you know, from those of us who are working 20 to 40 hours a week to the people that are thrown in a few hours a week on a given day. Yeah, definitely. Um, Josh, as we wrap this thing up here, was, was there anything else you wanted to share that maybe we didn't get a chance to touch on? Uh, no, just, you know, consider supporting the partners that you see out there that are working with us, uh, be it the way imports, be it our sponsors who help make the event and the contributions uh, toward the final day event. And I guess I should circulate back on that. We talked about all the events going on throughout the week. The big one, come down to the final day weigh in event. Uh, not only are we awarding out the big checks and the, the prizes and getting stories from all the members, but every year we have a trailer load it's an endless raffle. Oh, my gosh. The like everybody's walking away with big bags yeah. of gear, of just tons of stuff. And, and not only that, but not just smokers yeah. and everything. Chest coolers, smokers, fishing gear, uh, uh, you know, haircuts. I mean, I mean we like just a, a pile a of prizes. Just, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a trailer, a yeah. semi-truck trailer full of stuff. The popcorn raffle, the same. That's a really cool event. You pay $5, you buy a bag of popcorn. With it, you draw from a random bag of tokens. Uh, they, last year, we hit them in little mini envelopes. We'll see what the format is this year. But there's uh, color stickers. There's a base level. And then, like, tiers one, two, and three beyond that. You could win a Blackstone grill, and you know, a $500 Blackstone grill, a chest freezer, a, a $300 Lego set. I mean, we have different donated prizes. And even the basic ones, you're guaranteed to get like a round of mini golf, a free thing of ice cream from the local marina from you know, Reef Point, uh, roller skating at the local roller rink. We have 
you're, you're getting your money back almost every single time. There's not really a loser in there. Yeah. It's just, you know, and all those proceeds go to fund those outreach programs. So the club does the river cleanup every spring. We do, uh, we have throw rings along the south wall. The county has covered the north wall with throw rings for safety because that's where the beach is. Our club went and invested in the throw rings and cases on the south wall. The week after we installed them, someone fell in and they were saved by use of the throw ring. So we cover that. We cover the kids' fishing clinic. We do scholarship grants for uh, both students and local high school fishing teams. Uh, there's so many things that we do that the success of this event and the final day event fundraising all culminates in funding. So help us make those programs happen for the community. Yeah. And and, and I know, obviously, we were focused quite a bit on Salmonorama, but just quickly, outside of Salmonorama, being a part of the of the SU club is great yeah. for, for those that <laughs> want to get better at fishing. Yeah. Networking, which we, we, we harp on about, yes. which is going to be one of the fastest ways for you to, to get better at fishing. Mm-hmm. That's the exact reason network. I joined. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, and then you, you know, have the camaraderie amongst other anglers, um, and, uh, so many benefits to it. And I say that to say that you should really consider, uh, for those of you that are, that are already salmon fishing, it's a, what's his annual membership? Uh, it's 45 to start 35 a year renewal. I mean, thirty-five bucks. That's a flasher and a half. That's a flasher and a flaw. Right. That's <laughs> I don't know. It might be one now. moonshines. I mean, you know, like you, you know. So so five uh, moonshines. Some... Maybe, maybe maybe not quite five, but Rob, I'm shopping. <laughs> <laughs> you get what I'm, my, my point here, though, yeah. is is make the investment because you're gonna help the club. Um, and you know, the other thing too is the the more membership uh, numbers that these clubs have. It gives them more leverage at the table when it comes to the working DNR. with other DNR yeah. and other members that may want to pull back on something. Not saying yeah. that they are, because right now, like it's been oh, a no. really, it's been a really good relationship. The, the DNR is fantastic. Yeah, but we and we actually provide uh, equipment to them from time to time. We have the weir that we help manage in Racine uh, that they use for the steelhead yep. capture and yep. as backup site, I think, for uh, yep. the Kings as and well. And we did a video there. Which you did a great please video. There. Check that out. It was a great yeah. video with DNR. Yeah. yeah. So that that. Uh, you know, relationship is, is quite good, and there are yeah. other community ones. The uh, uh, WL, Kenosha, oh, Racine, sport, uh, Kenosha Sports Fishing uh, Conservation. Yep. Yeah, and that and um, WLBA. WLBA. That's the one I'm trying to think of. Arnie does a fantastic yeah. job representing the waterway up here uh, from a, a fisherman perspective, mm-hmm. and you know we we are involved in helping with uh, with them too and representing their causes. So. Yeah, you don't have to make a meeting every week. You don't, right. or every month, or just that membership number. So when they go to the table, we are X amount of people yes. strong. Yeah. That gives them the backing so that these federal partners and other businesses or whatever take them seriously. Okay, they got, they've got strength in numbers, right? They, that, yep. That's the backing so that if they say, hey, we're going to take a stance on this, yep. oh, we're not playing. They've got thousand plus people behind them you know that's a significant number of people so it, it, it a 35 dollar spend you know and i know you guys and I've, I've actually been working with you in terms of uh getting things in, in more in the digital space so yes. that you guys can reach your 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 membership um a lot more <laughs> digitally we're only as good as our members and volunteer uh, and their skill sets or, or volunteers and their skill sets yeah so i'm uh i'm working to learn uh, some of the software that you're using yeah uh, we do stream our meetings to our membership. Just, and uh, I've been saying that's be one of the best things, make yeah. it accessible from home. They can sit there and still yeah. at least kind of pitch in and comment in the chat. That is, uh, if, if you can't make the meetings in person, every one of our meetings for Wisconsin are uh, broadcast on Zoom to our membership. And, uh, you know, happily, you sign up, you'll get that link. I send out an email every month talking about the activities upcoming. And it's got the uh, current meeting Zoom link in there so that you can follow along. Yeah, so uh, we'll link down below in the video here to SU's website where you can check them out, get more information. It's also where the buoy link is. And the buoy link is there as yep. well. Salmon uh, Arama links are going to be in there to connect yep. to that. Um, any, any final uh, thoughts or, or words, Josh? No, if you, you know, I, I'll say if you want to get uh, out uh, and in touch with us, either for involvement or for questions, you know, my club email is josh at suwis.org. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you know, we're we're more than happy to hear from our constituents on things we could do better, uh, things that we do well that you want to be involved with or do more of. But we, you know, we're guided by our membership and by our constituents as to what we're going to do. 
So there you have it, guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed kind of the inner workings, getting a, a much more uh, in-depth view as to what it takes to put Sam and Rama together, Sam and Rama together, as well as talking about what they got going on for the big 50th this year um, and just the club over, overview as well. So you know, a little bit more information out there. Cause sometimes anglers don't really know. They know the club, but I don't know what it does. And hopefully we we're able a to lot. convey that information, yeah. man. It really is. Um, so get involved. Rob, final thoughts? Yeah, looking forward to Salmon Rammer this year. I think we'll be going to see some of the bands and yeah. fishing in the fishing pond with Eating the kids food. and all yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and being burnt out by the end of it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a pretty busy week for me. Oh, yeah. for all, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not just you. What do you mean? <laughs> We're spooling up coppers a week before, I know. a couple yeah. weeks before. Yeah. Like, yeah, we need a 600 copper. Oh, you're fishing salmon around my door. Automatically, they're fishing. All right. Yeah, anyway. what reel was that? Uh, that you can stick a 600? The Solterra. Oh, my yep. God. Yeah, that, that giant reel. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, saltwater the, that's reel. the new in-law. That's Rod. the big fish killer right yeah. there. It yeah. is. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe to the channel, and to check out more of our videos, podcasts, tutorials, and more right here on Lake Michigan Angler TV.